quest for a theory of everything. Kerry Gale Ferguson. In the Cockcroft Lecture Room on April 29, 1980, scientists and university dignitaries gathered in steep tires of seats facing a two-story wall of chalkboard and slide screen. The occasion was the inaugural lecture by a new location professor of mathematics, the 38-year-old mathematician and physicist Stephen Hawking. The title of the lecture was a question. Is the end in sight for theoretical physics? Hawking startled his listeners by announcing that he thought it was. He invited them to join him in a sensational escape through time and space to find the holy grail of science, the theory of that explains the universe and everything that happens in it. Stephen Hawking sat silently in a wheelchair while one of his students read his lecture to the assembled company. Judged by appearance alone, Hawking didn't seem a promising choice to lead any adventure. Stephen William Hawking was born on 8th January 1942 in Oxford, England. It was exactly 300 years after the death of Galileo, the father of modern science. Frank and Isabel Hawking, Stephen's parents, were not wealthy, but they believed in the value of education. So they planned for Stephen to go to Westminster a famous public school in the heart of London. Unfortunately, Stephen was ill at the time of the scholarship examination for Westminster. Therefore, he attended the local St Albans School. By the time he was eight, he was thinking seriously about becoming a scientist. Frank Hawking encouraged his son to follow him into medicine. But Stephen found biology too imprecise. He wanted a subject in which he could look for exact answers and get to the root of things. Young Stephen was no prodigy. He was just an ordinary English schoolboy, slow in learning to read, his handwriting the despair of his teachers. He was ranked no more than halfway up in his class, though he now says in his own defence, it was a very bright class. At 14, Stephen knew that he would pursue mathematics and physics. His father called this impractical, for there were no jobs in mathematics except teaching. Moreover, he wanted a son to attend his own college and Oxford offered no mathematics. He followed his father's advice and studied chemistry, physics and only a little mathematics in preparation for the entrance into Oxford. He did well in physics and the interview was brilliantly accepted. In 1959, at the age of 17, Hawking went to Oxford to study natural science and to specialize in physics. He joined University College, his father's college and the oldest at Oxford, founded in 1249 AD. Nevertheless, for about a year and a half, Hawking was lonely and bored. He was not inspired to relieve his boredom by exerting himself academically. But halfway through his second year, he began enjoying Oxford. He became popular and well accepted among his peers. 
they remember him as lively, buoyant and adaptable. He wore his hair long, was famous for his wit, liked classical music and science fiction and took part in sports. However, at the end of the third year, Hawking almost floundered. He selected theoretical physics as a speciality. He had then applied to do a PhD at Cambridge and was accepted on condition that he got a first from Oxford. Hawking was confident that he could get through successfully, but as the examination day approached, his confidence failed. Hawking ended up disastrously on the borderline between a first and a second. Faced with the borderline result, the examiners summoned Hawking for an interview and questioned him about his plans. In spite of the tenseness of the situation, Hawking managed to come up with a kind of remark for which he was famous among his friends. If I get a first, I shall go to Cambridge. If I receive a second, I'll remain at Oxford. So, I expect that you will give me a first. He got his first and he went to Cambridge. His first year at Cambridge was worse than that at Oxford. His slipshod mathematical background caught up with him and he found general relativity extremely tough. Another far more disastrous problem arose then. During his third year at Oxford, Hawking started getting clumsy. He had fallen once or twice for no apparent reason. The following autumn at Cambridge, he had trouble tying his shoes and sometimes he had difficulty talking. Shortly after his 21st birthday in 1963, Hawking contracted a rare disease, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, for which there was no known cure. It caused a gradual disintegration of the nerve cells in the spinal cord and the brain. At first, he went into a deep depression. He did not know what he ought to do or what his future would be like. My dreams at that time were rather confused, he admitted. Before my condition was diagnosed, I had been very bored with life. There did not seem to be anything worth doing. But shortly after I came out of hospital, I dreamt that I was going to be executed. I suddenly realized that there were a lot of worthwhile things to do, if I were reprieved. Another recurring dream was the idea of sacrificing my life to save others. After all, if I were going to die, I might as well do some good. Hawking's doctors hoped that his condition would stabilize, but the disease aggravated rapidly. They soon informed him that he had only about two more years to live. Two years passed. The progression of the disease has slowed. I didn't die. In fact, although there was a cloud hanging over my future, I found to my surprise that I was enjoying life in the present more than before. Total disability and death, though still a not too distant certainty, were postponed. Hawking had his reprieve, a precarious and a temporary one, but life was precious. At a New Year's party at St. Albans, just before he entered the hospital for tests, Hawking met Jane Wilde. To her, this disheveled graduate student seemed terribly intelligent, eccentric and rather arrogant. But he was interesting and she liked his wit. When Jane met him again after his discharge from the hospital, he was really in a pathetic state. I think he has lost his will to love. He was very confused, she commented. She was not, however, put off by his physical or mental condition. She was rather a shy teenager, serious-minded, with a strong faith in God, ingrained from childhood by her mother 
and the belief that good can come out of any adversity hawking admired her optimism and their friendship developed slowly after a while the two began to realize in jane's words that together we could make something worthwhile for stephen that made all the difference he applied for a research fellowship at cas one of the colleges in cambridge university in 1965 at the age of 23 hawking received his fellowship at cas and in july of the same year jane and he were married people who remember hawking in the university in the late 1960s recall him making his way around the corridors with a cane supporting himself against the wall he spoke with what sounded like a slight speech impediment but more than that they remember his brashness in sessions involving some of the world's most distinguished scientists while other young researchers kept a reverential silence hawking daringly asked unexpected and penetrating questions he clearly knew what he was talking about his reputation as a genius another einstein began then in 1980 a practical need for funds launched him into a new enterprise that was to have a far reaching impact on the hawkings and to those all over the world he thought of writing a book about the universe about the most interesting questions that had made him want to study cosmology and quantum theory where did the universe come from is the universe infinite or does it have any boundaries will it come to an end if so how is there a complete theory of the universe and everything in it is there a beginning of time could time run back The book begins by rewinding the great theories of the cosmos from Newton to Einstein. He wrote the book to make science understandable to non-scientists. He completed the first draft in 1984. While the revision process was going on, he made a trip to Switzerland. There he was down with pneumonia. and was left on a life support system doctors gave a choice as to whether a tracheotomy operation which would remove his windpipe should be conducted or not it might save his life but afterwards he would never again be able to speak or make a vocal sound with grave misgivings jean consented the future looked very bleak jean remarked Hawking could no longer breathe through his mouth and nose but only through a permanent opening made in his throat after many weeks of intensive care he went home to join Jane and his three children he was still too weak and ill to continue his research Walt Walters a computer expert in California sent him a program he had developed called the equalizer which allowed hawking to select words from the screen he thought he would be unable to finish his book with the support of a student brian wit a brief history of time was published in 1988 september 2005 so the release of an abridged version of the original book this version was updated to address the new issues that had arisen due to further scientific developments one will encounter a multitude of paradoxes in the book in science and with people things are often not what they seem and pieces that ought to fit together refuse to do so you will learn that beginnings may be endings cruel circumstances can lead to happiness although fame and success may not two great scientific theories taken together seem to give us nonsense 
Empty space is not empty. Black holes are not black. And a man whose appearance inspires shock and pity takes his laughing to where the boundaries of time and space ought to be, but are not. It is, of course, a miracle that Hawking has been able to achieve everything he has, that he is still alive. However, when you experience his intelligence and humor, you begin to take his unusual mode of communication and his obviously catastrophic physical problems no more seriously than he seems to himself. That is exactly the way he wants it. He chooses to ignore the difficulty and he expects others to adopt the same attitude. Stephen Hawking has overcome his crippling disease to become the supernova of world physics.